All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation on flow computers or electronic flow measurement, ILM 310302P. Uh, I believe this is second last ILM in the measurement section uh, of this course. Uh, this presentation is about 32 slides, not too, not too long. Uh, I don't believe there's any math for us to really worry about in this one, so that's nice. So we'll talk about flow computers and give you uh, some information on what they do and how we use them in industry. Objectives today, uh, describing the parameters uh, for a flow computer, describing the principles and applications of flow computers, components of flow computers, and the advantages and limitations of flow computers. So starting out, uh, we'll just talk about what a flow computer does. <clears throat> a flow computer does calculations to correct variables, flowing conditions into variables at standard conditions. This allows for standard reporting required by the government agencies and businesses that uh, rely on exchange of goods and services. Um, some of the things that we look at um, when we're dealing with flow computers and the variables that are involved with flow computers and the uh, and that conversion between flowing conditions and standard conditions uh, will include the composition of the media, the temperature, the pressure, the flow, uh, whether it's a gas or liquid, and the type of meter that we are using to measure. Um, flow computers basically uh, take over from chart recorders, I guess, if we wanted to go back in history a little bit. Um, they take measurements of flow, uh, and pressure and sometimes temperature and do some math on them to convert obviously into some type of a standard unit that we can use for uh, commerce or trade. <clears throat> so we use EFMs for both gases and liquids and when we deal with these two particular applications we have to be uh, aware of the properties of each of the different mediums um, so we know what kind of things need to be configured uh, into a flow computer. Uh, the most obvious variable that uh, differentiates gas and liquid flow is the compressibility of gases uh, versus liquids. And uh, you'll see in some of the math examples in the ILM here, uh, we go into a theoretical explanation of uh, how compressibility comes into play when we're doing uh, conversions uh, between uh, flowing conditions and, and standard conditions. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest things that differentiate the two types of uh, fluid mediums, the, the gases and the liquids, is the uh, compressibility that we have to deal with uh, with gases. So there are standards of practice that are associated um, with flow computers. Uh, in Alberta here, we look at Directive 17, which tells us uh, what we have to do with each type of service when we're dealing with flow computers. It requires compliance with the uh, American Gas Association and ANSI standards, and we've seen a few of these AGA standards uh, as we've discussed some uh, measuring devices uh, throughout the, the duration of this course here, uh, different numbers related to uh, different measuring devices. So depending on which uh, measuring devices you're using, there will be some requirement for compliance with some type of uh, standard for sure. Measurement Canada, of course, requires compliance to its own standards, uh, and we have to just be aware of what the standards of practice are when we're dealing with uh, flow, comp flow computers. And again, this is more of a, uh, an accounting uh, situation, and we just want to make sure that apples are compared to apples and oranges are compared to oranges. So doing gas volume calculations, uh, starting out right off the giddy up go, we'll start with gas. Gas flows are measured basically three ways. We can measure uh, gas with differential pressure meters. Uh, we can use linear or positive displacement meters, or we can use mass flow meters. So obviously that's the whole gamut of uh, different types of technology and flow measurement. Um, but depending on which ones we pick, we may have to use multiple uh, different meters in order to accomplish our goals and meet the standards as set out by uh, whichever ones it is that we are following. Differential pressure meters, we'll just talk real quickly about each of these here, measure the differential pressure across a restriction like an orifice plate, hopefully you know that by now. 
Uh, how we use them is stipulated by Directive 17 in Alberta and tells us that we have to use AGA3 uh, year 2000 calculations uh, for either mass flow or volumetric flow. And as you can see here, there's some pretty elaborate uh, calculations that are uh, involved with using these uh, differential pressure meters uh, for gas flow. Um, we don't get into the math, thankfully, uh, in this course, but it is important uh, theoretically that you, that you see that the difference here on the left-hand side, uh, where we're calculating mass flow rate uh, for a liquid, um, and on the other side here, where we're uh, calculating uh, volumetric flow at standard conditions uh, for a gas. The major differentiation between, uh, I guess, the two of them uh, mathematically is the variable Z, which relates to compressibility, and again, uh, the major difference between gas flows and liquid flows. Unit conversion factors. Uh, this is a big thing in the ILM. Uh, it kind of caught me off guard the first time I saw it. It's one of the variables. Uh, you'll see here this M1 variable is the unit conversion factor. Uh, there's a few pages in the ILM that talk about it, so I thought I would just kind of talk about it a little bit because it encompasses a bunch of things that are kind of uh, all wrapped up in each other. Uh, and the purpose for that variable is to account for the engineering units used uh, by some variables, constants, and standard conditions. Standard conditions typically are 101.325 kPa and 15 degrees Celsius when we're doing flow measurements. Um, but there are also a number of other specifications that you'll find in the related AGA requirement for the device that we're dealing with. In the case of the differential pressure meter here, we have to worry about the orifice diameter, uh, the differential pressure we're expecting in kPa as a unit, static pressure measured as a unit in kPaA, temperature measured in Kelvin, um, flow run bore, expansion rate, reference temperature. Um, all of these things come into play. We have to just be aware of the things that are wrapped up in inside of these uh, standards. So uh, coefficient of discharge covered under AGA3, compressibility is covered under AGA8, and relative density also covered under AGA8. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you with the amount of uh, stuff here uh, and the specifics of, of these details. Um, when we cover the devices, um, you should be able to associate the device type with the AGA standard that's applicable to it. Um, and I don't expect you to be able to specifically define uh, the requirements uh, of each of these AGA standards, but do, do know that for differential pressure, for example, we need to use AGA3 uh, specifically when we're doing liquids and if we're dealing with uh, differential pressure and a gas, it also involves some components from AGA8 as well. Uh, that are related uh, to the relationship between uh, gases and liquids and how we could drive a, a flow, uh, accurate flow comparison between the two. Okay, uh, if you looked in the ILM, you'd see on the pages five to 10 uh, that it's a complicated process doing all the calculations. And in a long story short, this is why we have flow computers, because if we had to do this all the time, the um, potential for human error and the complexity of it is, um, can be a challenge. Looking at the same idea here with PED or linear meters, this is taken off uh, page seven here, just shows you quickly how we have AGA standards that apply to specific devices here. So um, spend a little bit of time trying to, um, you know, wrap your head around what end devices uh, you're using and what the appropriate AGA standard is for uh, that particular device. AGA7, uh, volumetric flow at standard conditions off page, page 11 here. Uh, the flow calculation, as you see it in the ILM, includes um, a bunch of factors to convert from, again, base conditions to standard conditions or flowing conditions to standard conditions. Um, one of the major ones here, of course, is pressure, pressure and or temperature base factors. Um, the flow calculation includes these factors in order to convert from flowing conditions uh, to base conditions. Pressure correction factor and the temper, temperature correction factor, um, also under AGA7 uh, at standard conditions, and the compressibility ratio factor for flowing to standard conditions, as well as a meter factor for improving and traceability. So there's a lot of different things that we uh, 
have to consider, I guess, when we're talking about full computers. To, the good thing for us is it's usually a one-time deal once we get it all uh, identified and, and configured. We don't have to worry about it too much after that. Mass meter variables, uh, AJ11, specifically speaking with Coriolis meters here. So again, putting putting an AGA standard to a device uh, is is kind of handy. For Coriolis meters, uh, we know that they're uh, they can do volumetric flow. We can do the they can do mass flow, they can measure density, they measure temperature, um, all of these good things. Um, for us to use a Coriolis meter, we need to convert mass flow into volumetric flow at standard conditions. And this is simply an exercise of dividing the mass flow by the density as we've done in previous exercises. We will also need to input the meter factor, uh, what the standard conditions are and the density of the medium at these standard conditions. So again, speaking about the large number of different variables required uh, for a flow computer in order for it to be able to perform the calculations that we want it to do automatically uh, for us. Liquid volume calculations, another, another feature of uh, the capability of an uh, electronic flow measuring device or a flow computer. Measurement of liquids. Uh, such as crude, bitumen, condensate, liquid propane, gas, and water, uh, all common mediums here in Alberta follow API guidelines. This is the American Petroleum Institute. Um, standard conditions for liquid volume is 15 degrees Celsius and zero kPa. Um, we have to have all the required auxiliary equipment, obviously, in, in place related specifically to our devices. In this case, we're talking about Coriolis meters. Um, so strainers, air eliminators, proving valves, piping, all of these wonderful things uh, have to be in place. <clears throat> Liquid flows um, measured also in three ways, uh, linear volumetric uh, flows, which we've covered a lot of devices that will, will do this measurement for us. Uh, mass flow, uh, specifically Coriolis is a major one that we've talked about, and then differential uh, using a differential tra transmitter and some type of a uh, differential pressure creating device, whether it's an orifice plate or a venturi tube or whatever it might happen to be. <clears throat> some of the linear volumetric meters that we've talked about, again, just for review, uh, include positive displacement, turbine, ultrasonic, vortex, and mag meters. Most of the devices that we talked about throughout our uh, course have been linear volumetric meters. Uh, with the exception of differential pressure, which was uh, requiring square root extraction that differentiated it from the rest of the group. So when we're dealing with linear meter variables, there's of course things we have to correct for as well. Um, because these meters measure uh, the flow rate or volumetric flow rate for custody and transfer, uh, custody transfer applications, we must also do a number of things in here to make sure once again that we're uh, making, uh, taking flowing or base conditions and putting them into some standard uh, that can be used for trade. So we will have to apply a volumetric meter factor uh, to the indicated volume. We will have to compensate for pressure and temperature where required. Uh, again, throwing in pressure and temperature uh, allows us to compensate for density. Uh, we will also possibly be asked to adjust for volume for shrinkage and contaminants when we're, we're dealing with oil. And in the ILM, it talks about, uh, you know, entrained gases that are in uh, in the oil or what percentage of water uh, is in the oil. And again, by having other things that we don't want uh, in our medium, it does uh, it does uh, affect not only the quality of the of the product, but also um, the volume. Uh, it represents a volume that we're measuring. Um, but it's not what we're actually after, so it does create some errors. So we need to be uh, aware of that. And looky, lucky, lucky for us, there's a wonderful formula to do this conversion from volumetric flow to a gross standard volume. Whoops. And uh, before you get too excited here, uh, we don't necessarily do any of this math, um, but we do want to bring the theory uh, to into light here so that we can understand kind of what's going on. Uh, behind the scene here. So we're calculating basically we want to find first our um, our gross uh, standard volume here. 
using a bunch of variables here. So indicated volume, the liquid temperature correction factor, uh, pressure correction factor, and a meter factor, which will give us our, our gross volume. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, oil specifically here, uh, we're talking about that shrinkage uh, and water sediment and correction factor. So a couple of factors, again, that have to be applied in order for us to be able to take flowing conditions and put them into some kind of uh, a standard representation. And again, once upon a time, uh, we would have to do this math in order to, to calculate that. But now, uh, thankfully, uh, electronic flow measurement devices do most of this for us. Okay, mass meter variables, just real quick here. Um, mass flow needs to be corrected to volumetric by dividing by the density. So pretty straightforward here. Density is at 15 degrees Celsius and pretty simple mathematical formula, again, that we don't really have to do. Uh, this is what the flow computer does for us. So it can calculate our gross volume by multiplying the meter factor uh, uh, by the ratio of the mass to the density at standard conditions. So a lot of different things uh, going on. So here's differential meter variables again, AGA3 just for a little bit of reinforcement. So DP AGA3, Coriolis was AGA11. Um, there were some other uh, twists on this differential where we talked about AGA8 for a little bit, and I believe that will come up, um, may come up again in this presentation, I'm not sure. Um, but again, the, the portions from AGA had to do with compensating for um, temperature and pressure in a different situation. So again, theoretically, a lot of things going on here in terms of what needs to be compensated for, and you will generally find the, the variables in the equation here, not, not again that I expect you to know all of these variables, um, but at the point in the course where we are uh, right now, uh, you do understand the different pressure, density, um, temperature and pressure compensation factors that are all all required and wrapped up into the calculations uh, that we that we need in order to get us to standard conditions. That was a little bit heavy theoretically, uh, a long way of saying that the the math for different applications and different measuring devices uh, in order to convert from flowing conditions to standard conditions can be very complicated uh, and involve a number of different variables depending on what we're using to measure. This is why flow computers are such a blessing. So moving to objective two here, let's describe the principles and applications of flow computers. So um, I think most people in Alberta, uh, instrument people, by the time they get to third year, have probably had some experience with a flow computer somewhere at some point in time. Um, flow computers can be used, obviously, for a few different things, process control uh, being one of them. Um, but probably the more popular application for uh, flow computers is custody transfer and reporting applications. And we'll talk specifically about why, um, why the majority of the benefit for flow computers is in this area here rather than in process control here. But let's look at them individually and see how that uh, comes into play. So process control, uh, if we relate this to standalone flow transmitters, uh, they do a good job of process control, um, but a device that does some flow computing will provide better data and therefore better control of a process. So again, not absolutely necessary in a process control application to have uh, a flow computer, but again, if you're dealing with uh, products that potentially have uh, variables that will change, temperature changes, pressure changes, uh, flow changes that all affect one another, having a flow computer uh, will allow us to, to do all the complicated calculations to ensure that we have accurate standard measurements that we can use. Uh, this can be done in, in uh, different ways. Uh, for example, process control can, uh, can measure flow, but we can also throw a pressure transmitter on the line and a temperature transmitter on the line, uh, feed those variables into our PLC, which is essentially a flow computer as well, uh, and it does the, the calculations that allow us to get standard variables. Custody transfer is uh, one of the areas where flow computers actually shine. 
they're best used in the custody transfer situation. And that's why you'll see flow computers uh, very popular on wellheads, uh, batteries and things like that, where we're collecting, uh, we're collecting natural resources, uh, pooling them up and then, and then moving them along for processing. Um, we have to report to the government what we take out of the ground, and then we have to report to whoever's buying that product uh, what's in there. Uh, and flow computers are an uh, excellent way of capturing all the different variables that are in play. Uh, they will typically have built-in record-keeping capabilities that enable the operators to provide necessary documentation to these agencies that they report to. So once upon a time, uh, an operator would have to come out on, on a daily or a, a weekly cycle and take flow measurements, pressure measurements, temp temperature measurements, record them on a, uh, you know, on this clipboard over the course of the month. And, that, and at the end of the month, you'd have to uh, summarize it and put it in an envelope and send it off to head office where the uh, bean counters could look at it. Uh, the benefit of flow computers now, of course, is that they can be networked uh, and hooked up uh, to a communication network. And all that information can go straight from the measuring device through the flow computer uh, to uh, some type of other software that can be used uh, for record keeping. So it is a real uh, benefit in terms of operations here. One of the other things that flow computers can do is that they're capable of recording loop changes or any alarms or situations that may have occurred at a facility. Um, so you can go back into the flow computer uh, as a historical log and look at first in, first out analysis, for example, uh, to analyze why a plant tripped um, or, you know, notice any particular changes that maybe an operator perhaps made that caused uh, some issues. So flow computers do uh, enhance the capabilities of uh, operations in general. Flow computer components, uh, pretty straightforward here. There's basically three designs of flow computers. As I said earlier, you could have a flow transmitter, a pressure transmitter, and a uh, temperature transmitter all hooked up onto the same spool of piping, uh, taking measurements and feed all those measurements into uh, a PLC, uh, which can do all the uh, same functions that a flow computer can do in a, in a modular uh, situation using software within the PLC program. Second uh, type is a panel mounted type of flow computer. Uh, you'll see these in um, things like the rock line uh, of flow computers. Um, they also have field mounted transmitter style uh, flow computers. Once upon a time, we used to have something called multivariable transmitters, which were uh, a, a simplified version uh, I guess, of a, of a flow computer in a way. Um, but again, the idea behind all of these uh, flow computers is to take in uh, a number of different variables, apply some mathematical calculations to them in order to get us all to standard conditions. So again, flow computers can be modular, uh, they can be panel mounted, or they can be field mounted. And aside from uh, the physical uh, mounting style of them, they all basically do the same uh, functions and have the same uh, components that do all the work. Some of the components that you'll find uh, include a microprocessor, of course, to do all the calculating, uh, I.O. points, so inputs and outputs, communication ports, power supplies, prover modules, all standard fare for um, computerized type systems like we're dealing with here today. So the microprocessor, without boring you all to death, performs all the computing and math as well as storage for data and the operating system. The memory is usually a, a RAM uh, that holds the operating system and different programs. Inputs and outputs uh, vary by design, but typically you'll find a multitude of options, including milliamp input, uh, pulse inputs from turbine meters, for example, frequency inputs, uh, RTD, uh, discrete inputs, same thing for outputs, analog outputs, digital outputs, pulse outputs, multitude of different possibilities depending on uh, the particular device or style of flow computer that you're dealing with. Um, the standalone ones may have less, uh, the PLC based ones may have more, but they all have the, the basic requirements in order to get the job done. Communications, uh, how do they interface? Well, there's lots of different ways, and we'll talk about 
these a lot more in fourth year, but Ethernet, RS-232, RS-485, USB, heart, uh, these are all some of the communication methods uh, that you can use, and we will discuss those in fourth year more. Power, of course, required in order to make everything work. Um, the power in an electronic uh, flow measuring device is designed to be used for the processor and the modules, not the end devices. If you need to power your field devices, you will be using a separate uh, power supply to do that. Prover module, something fancy here that's a specialized module um, that has a high resolution timing circuit built into it to be used with various types of provers. And we have, of course, different uh, types of provers that we've talked about in different subjects here. So small volume provers, unidirectional or bidirectional provers, and master meters. Um, this is all, uh, again, tied into some of the variables that we have to worry about, one of them being uh, meter factor. Firmware. Uh, this is a computer, of course, and firmware is what keeps our computers up to date and tells us what the machine is capable of. Uh, it'll reside in the flash memory. Uh, it's upgradable, so again, you want to be aware of what version of the firmware it is that you're using. And it will be able to do uh, standard calculations for most of the industry standards that we have talked about, whether it be AGA or API or government standard or whatever it might be here. A um, bunch of other things associated with firmware here, data storage, memory loss protection, security features, alarm features, uh, documentation capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, usually with firmware, it kind of starts out rather rudimentary and as uh, demand or experience dictates, they do firmware updates in order to uh, generally add more features as, as the uh, as the software kind of evolves. Um, something specific, I guess, out of the ILM here says when you install a uh, flow computer, you must have it verified by a regulator uh, within two weeks of installation. I don't know if that's 100% true in all situations or not, um, but that is mentioned in the ILM. Last objective here, advantages and limitations for flow computers. So pretty much wrap it up in a, in a nutshell, pretty simple. Uh, flow computers are basically the replacement for chart recorders. Uh, many improvements come with using flow computers, such as improved accuracy, better rangeability, and much more capable of providing uh, compensation factors as needed uh, in order to meet certain industry standards. Downside or disadvantages of flow computers is that they are more expensive, uh, they are complicated, so they do require some extended knowledge uh, in order to be able to configure and operate. Uh, those of you who have dealt with flow computers probably recognize this. Um, again, it's it's uh, the, the design of these here is to try to make all the terrible theoretical math calculations a lot easier by wrapping it up in a machine uh, that will do it for us. But in order for that to happen, uh, we do have to understand the theory behind it uh, so that we can properly configure and operate a flow computer. So not any real groundbreaking stuff brought out here today, probably. Um, hopefully you've got a general idea of what a flow computer does. The um, main idea here is that it generally makes our life easier by doing all the calculations required to get from uh, flowing or base conditions to some type of a standard condition so that we can meet the requirements of some type of a specific uh, standard or market necessity for custody transfer, for example. That is the end of the lecture today. We will see you again shortly. Have a good day.